Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 4th, 2021, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker Pro Tem. Um, last week, I got behind this microphone, and we were actually trying to show something that was a bit optimistic, but we're also, like everyone else on our side, the frustration we're going through on so many of the Democrat policies that, that I don't think were meant to be mean-spirited are so dystopian in the damage they've caused, particularly to the working poor, which is one of my fixations. But sometimes the economics is the economics, law of um, sometimes virtue signaling over the unintended consequences. But I want to go over something and, and try to explain why I think this is such a big deal for both those on the left, those of us on the right, and is actually a window of optimism, but it's going to take a policy pivot. So last week I got up here and talked about that, as you remember, I gave a couple presentations last December, major success in curing type 1 diabetes. Now it's only really one um, use case where they were able to take T cells and convert them into insulin producing cells. In that particular one, the individual would need some um, immunosuppressant because the body's reaction to it. Now we have an organization that's doing somewhat the same technology with T cells, turning them into insulin producing cells, but with CRISPR as a partner, they're doing a tiny tweak and the model says the body won't recognize it as a foreign cell and you won't need immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of your life. So conceptually, why is this such a big, 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 big deal to have a cure for type 1? And as the big article on it, as you dig through the literature, says at least for people with type 2, we might have a way to get their body, we, actually we do have a way Dear Lord, that the technology be true and actually coming forward to help individuals in type 2, their bodies to produce insulin again. Then we have some other big policy things we would have to do here. We'd have to have an honest conversation of how we do nutrition support. We'd have to have an honest conversation of what we do in the farm bill, of what we encourage Americans to grow instead of just the sort of the commodity crops North America used to grow 3,500 different types of grains. Maybe you design a farm system that allows sort of both regional and uniqueness and for different arid climates and others, sort of a, 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 a concophony or whatever the proper word there would be for optionality. Because there is a food security issue when you only grow certain crops. God forbid you have, like it's happening in parts of Europe, where Olive trees have a type of fungus, and olive trees are hundreds and hundreds of years old or dying. We make ourselves much more fragile in food security. So I sort of say that because I actually see an elegant solution coming here. If we could change the way we view public policy, because it's often this right-left paradigm of the left's version of wanting to be compassionate is they're going to build more clinics for those in urban areas and my tribal communities and even certain rural populations that have just stunning percentages of type 2 diabetes and, and the misery that comes with that, put up more clinics. And my argument is, screw that, let's cure it. If, 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 the, if we're seeing technology that may lead us to a cure, do put the resources forward that create the disruption because curing a misery is so much more wonderful than helping people being able to maintain and live within their misery. Oh, by the way, for those of us who are absolutely fixated that the debt is going to destroy this republic, it makes a hell of a lot of difference. So let's walk through some of the math of why I wish we were having this level of optimism that the technology disruptions we have now on knowing how to cure so many diseases actually may be the path that we start to take on the crushing debt that's coming. This is important, and this is year-old data from CBO. It's a year out of date. The numbers today are much worse. In 29 years, 
$112 trillion of publicly borrowed debt in today's dollars. Vast majority of it is Medicare, Social Security. Rest of the budget is in balance. Why this is so important is the political class, particularly here in Washington, we have lied for decades to our constituents. The left will say, oh, rich people don't pay enough. We spend too much money on defense. Republicans, oh, we got to get rid of foreign aid, waste and fraud. Maybe all those are true, but they're not the driver of the debt. The debt is demographics. We are getting old as a society, and you're going to see some slides later on that really will kick you in the head on these numbers. But that $112 trillion of publicly borrowed debt, as projected by CBO last year, and this is a number that says there's no more pandemics, no more recessions. How many of you want to have a secure retirement? How many of you give a darn about your kids? Well, think about one little factoid here. You just saw that Medicare was the primary driver of U.S. sovereign debt. What was it, 77, 78 trillion dollars of borrowing over the next 29 years. 31% of Medicare is just diabetes. Now you're seeing the tie. If I come to you and say, I hope it works, but, but considering the numbers and the benefit of if it does work, why aren't we, at least the left and the right, saying let's end people's misery? Oh, by the way, by doing that, one of the greatest effects we can have on society is actually curing these diseases that make us poor, sicker, and actually the primary drivers of our debt. 31% of Medicare spending is just related to diabetes, 33% of all health care costs. So remember, the, the, the problem with this place is Obamacare, the ACA, the Republican alternative, were finance bills. They weren't about what we spend, they were who got subsidized. The, I mean, that's the math. You know, the, the, the Democrats' bill had three tiers, the Republicans had four tiers, but it was who was cross-subsidizing who and then how much was coming out of the general fund to subsidize those groups. They were spending subsidization bills. They had nothing to do with what we spent. My argument is if we would embrace the technology, push it forward, and we have to change a bunch of laws to legalize the very technology that will disrupt health care costs, we save Medicare. But we also end a hell of a lot of misery in our society. And is that Republican or Democrat? I'm mean, sure at some point someone will contribute to one side or the other, and we'll turn it into partisan, right? But at least between now and then, it's technology. And once again, I, I fixate on this also. 5% of our brothers and sisters who have multiple chronic conditions are the majority of our health care spending. If you say you care about health care, is it nationalizing health care? Well, once again, nationalizing health care, the, the um, uh, what is it, the, the uh, uh, Medicare for all doesn't remove any costs. It just collectivizes how you can ration. If you want to reduce costs, cure people in the misery. Once again, 5% of our brothers and sisters are the majority of our health care spending. You already see what's going on right now with some of the messenger RNA, some of the new stem cell therapies, the number of diseases we're curing. We now have a cure for hemophilia. We're in the, about to have um, the trials for um, uh, uh, oh, um, sickle cell. You already see in, in so many diseases we're taking on. So many of the blood cancers today we can cure. But the 10,000 pound gorilla is diabetes. And, and this is, so this is both, maybe it's a little bit utopianism, but we've seen a perfect example of this. Do you remember this body just a decade or so ago? We were having a real stressor. We were having to have conversations with state Medicaid systems on how we were going to pay for all these liver transplants. For those people who may have had too good of time in the 70s, remember, 
We had hundreds of thousands of individuals in the United States that we thought were having failing livers from hepatitis C. Liver transplant clinics were being funded and organized all over the country. And then suddenly, I think the dr first drug out was Sobaldi. We figured out how to cure it. And the drug was outrageously expensive. It was like $88,000, but it was a fraction of the cost of a liver transplant and then someone spending the rest of their life on anti-rejection drugs. And then another drug came to market with a slightly different technology. Price crashed, saved a fortune, ended lots of future misery. We lived in the last decade an example of what I'm talking about. But I beg of my friends on the Democrat side, think about your legislation like HR3. We know HR3 functionally makes big pharma bigger because it incentivizes them to take their current portfolio of our pharmaceuticals, make little tweaks, and keep them. But the capital stack for the small biotechs that are disruptive is crushed. There's good articles out there. There's good economic papers that make it very clear. If the Democrats get their way, it's great politics. It's absolutely brilliant politics. Talk about drug prices and how outraged we are. We are outraged. But are we outraged to the point that you are going to kill the next generation because they don't get that pharmaceutical that's curative? We need to think maybe more with a calculator like economists, maybe economists with a soul and a heart, than, hey, this is brilliant for the next election cycle. And back again. Think about the body, the place we work in. We go home, we campaign, we say all the wonderful things we're going to do. But the fact of the matter, this last fiscal year, 77% of all the spending here was on autopilot. It's what we call mandatory. 10% was defense. 13% was everything else. We act like we are here doing something. When if, you, if you put defense and say we're just going to keep the baseline where it's at and the 77% is mandatory, Social Security, Medicare, you fall under a certain income, you're part of a certain ethnic or tribal group, or you hit a certain age, or you, it's automatic, it's formulaic. This is all we get to focus on. This is what all the theater here is about. And one of the reasons I think the theater has gotten so hyperbolic is we know this is what wipes us out. And not one person here has actually voted on this. It's been, except for the last handful of votes the Democrats have moved forward, where we were adding, like we just did today, in a piece of legislation that actually added to mandatory spending. Because it's easy. Makes you look like a hero. Hey, it's all we protected. It's there. But we don't have the resources to pay for it. And these slides now, to give you an idea how crappy the last fiscal year was and how much we borrowed, these slides are all out of date now. The numbers are much worse. And one of the reasons I grabbed this one is, take a look here. This was 2030. We're going to hit $30 trillion of borrowing. Oh, God, we hit that last week. Think about what we've done and there was a time here, a couple decades ago, the discussion was, well, are you willing to do entitlement reform? Take that off the table. I know it's great political rhetoric, but it's too late. The majority, the vast majority of baby boomers are already in their retirement age. You missed the window. The window was a quarter, you know, quarter century ago if you were going to do entitlement reforms. Other than the things we've come here and talked about of the massive subsidies that we give actually to really, really, really rich people. You know, when it's their third home on Martha's Vineyard and we give them subsidized flood insurance. Or the Democrats Build Back Better bill, which if you could be making $400,000 to $800,000 a year and you were going to get, what was it, $125,000 in tax credits if you bought the right electric vehicle, the right solar panel. At some point, we need to have an honest conversation. We calculated over the next 10 years, there's one $1.4 trillion of subsidies to really rich people. 
So instead of the constant rhetoric of let's tax rich people more, make them pay their fair share, maybe we should just stop subsidizing them. Because the subsidies create distortions. So back to the thing we don't do here called math. The 2050 number. We were saying we were going to be at 195.0% of GDP. That number, the best calculation as of today, is 15 points higher than that. We'll be well over 200. And that's a baseline, not another pandemic, not another war, not another major recession. And then you start to deal with our newest reality. And I, I should have grabbed the slide. But you see part of it here. There's a model put out by CBO that says if interest rates over the time, that 29-year period, if the baseline borrowing cost in the United States was two points higher in that 25-year, every dime, every dime of tax receipts will go just to pay interest. We have made ourselves that fragile that if the cost of borrowing money goes up by two points on U.S. sovereign debts over the baseline, every dime in the future just goes solely to cover the interest cost. We've lost our minds. And yet, think of the crazy stuff we debate here. It's like we're desperate to debate the shiny objects, the stupid little indignation of the day. At the same time, we're borrowing $47,000 every second. $47,000 every second. And that's why I keep coming behind these mics saying it doesn't have to be this sort of dystopian, crushing future. I need the majority to think different, and I need my minority over here to think different. Because here's some of the drivers, and this is really uncomfortable. I've been booed in front of audiences when I've given this presentation, but the math is the math, and the math always wins. We can virtue signal. We can tell anecdotal stories. We can talk about how compassionate we are. But at some point, the math will win. And this is important, because I'm going to show you the sister slide to this in a couple moments. And you need to get our heads around this. The money you put in in taxes into Medicare, excuse me, into Social Security, and the money you're going to get out of Social Security, they're pretty close to each other. It, it's, it's, I mean, you actually get a little bit more out. It's a fairly even deal. But that chart you were seeing, substantially driven by this. So the average couple, and this is uh, someone who's retiring right about now, has put in about $161,000 into Medicare, and they're getting $522,000 out. And, that's, and, that's, and those are adjusted dollars. So ketibus, paribus, whatever the fancy term is. That gap there is the primary driver of US sovereign debt. So what happens when you talk to millennials? So we have offices all over here with kids born, born 1985. And they just think they're never going to see any of this. These are actual surveys where you know, they, they already see themselves in enough financial pain. They're worried. Then they have people like me get behind the microphone and show them the slides and basically say, if we don't do something about this, your retirement, and it's a technical economic term, you're screwed. We need to start using language like that around here because somehow the fancy language doesn't seem to sink into the thick skulls here. Do you care about this generation? You know, these 25-year-olds we have in our office that are freaky smart, they're working their hearts out, and they look at the numbers saying, oh my God, when they start getting near their retirement age, the United States will have a couple hundred percent of debt to GDP, and if interest rates are up, if interest rates are up, I didn't bring the slide, um, there's one model that says that 2% higher baseline borrowing cost, we go from that 210% debt to GDP in 29 years to about 300, 320%. Because the multiplying effect, because we never pay anything off. 
And the model as it is of today says that millennial, that person born in 1985, they're going to put $236,000 into Medicare. And if we don't do something to disrupt the cost of health care, they're going to take out over $1.2 million. And this makes the curve steepen. When you see the CBO curves, you wonder why it starts to steepen. It's this delta there. There is a hope, there is a path, but it needs to be everything. I have my health care disruptions, but I've also come here and talked about how you can change the immigration system to maximize economic growth and not crush the working poor. When you open up the borders, you, we, we brought the papers here, you crush the working poor because you flood the country with people with similar skill sets. You have a, the last, what is it, year and a half, we're what, um, 1.7 million behind in legal immigration. You know, the, the kid with the, just got the PhD at Arizona State University and we're sending him home. Um, the, you know, we've, you've seen the healthcare, you've seen, if you care about the environment, the concept of radically changing the way we look at regulation using crowdsourcing and data instead of the 1938 model of stick paper and file cabinets. A tax code that maximizes economic growth. Are we willing to have really disruptive conversations of should we go to a border adjustability model so you don't have a tax arbitrage for around the world to move products to the United States instead of making them here? There are ways, and the trick is, the model says you've got to do all of it almost at the same time. And this place can barely agree on what time of day it is. And then we've seen policies around here that when so many of our brothers and sisters who are older are basically saying it's the rational decision, I'm leaving the labor force. One of the other parts of that growth model is everyone's needed. Every American's needed. We need your talents, we need your labor, particularly if you're older. Would this place be willing to provide certain incentives? So you're 65, you don't need to retire, but we're gonna fix parts of the way we tax your benefits to incentivize you to stay in the labor force. There are ideas that work, that basically make the future something optimistic. And, and, and my wife and I joke about this, and I've said it behind this microphone a bunch of times, we're both 59 years old. And I have a six-year-old daughter. You know you're pathologically optimistic when you're 59 years old and you have a six-year-old daughter. But darn it, doesn't she have the right, doesn't the kid that's growing up in, in a neighborhood of poverty have the right, doesn't the person that's older have the right to have a decent retirement? Don't we have the right to be in a nation of optimism where we told the truth about the math and our demographics and then we provided an optimistic vision that gets us there instead of the crazy stuff that's been posed this last 12 months that we keep showing economists after coming, and these aren't conservative economists, They're, many of them are from liberal groups saying, you do realize Build Back Better by the end of the decade made poor people poorer. But it was great politics. Stop the crazy, buy a calculator, and then if we do it by math, I think you could actually see this body work together because an optimistic vision can be ours if we just fixate on the disruptions that make the future great. And with that, Speaker Pro Tem, I yield back.